Hello everyone and welcome back to the Toffee Blues YouTube channel, your source for all things Everton. You are joining us here for the Toffee Blues podcast. I haven't done one of these for a while, but we're jumping back on this week. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Mike Richards of the Unholy Trinity podcast. Mike, you're all good, mate? Very well, mate. Yeah, very well. As, as we were just saying before we came uh, we recorded then, it's nice uh, we're having a chat after a very, very positive Everton performance and, and a pulsating victory really, wasn't it? It is very positive indeed. You know, the most positive of the season by by some stretch, um, given everything that's happened over the last 12 months or so. Um, but before we jump in, you know, I think we're going to take things back a few weeks ago, unfortunately. And coming out, I'm going to take things back to that Newcastle United game at Goodison and we had the bus greet and everything. And we uh, um, there, there was there was very much an air of last season to it. You know, everyone really joined together, those scenes on Goodison Road, which we all saw. And um, we really got up for that game. And, and it, it just didn't go... Um, the way we wanted it to at all. Um, you know, we, we puffed our chests out for a little bit, but but ultimately, let's have it right. Newcastle battered us in the end. Um, and the feeling coming out of the ground that night, um, you know, there's been points in the season, you know, people say out of emotion, oh, that's us down, we're gone, we're, we're not coming back from this now. But it, but walking back through Stanley Park for me on, on after that Newcastle game, it felt quite real, I think. It felt quite real, and I just didn't see how we were going to get out of this now. And I came on here, actually, and I said that relegation felt inevitable. Um, I just looked at the fixtures we had, Everton's um, historically performances away from home, and I just didn't see how we would how we would get out of it. And, and it did feel like there was a, a feeling of resignation around Goodison Park that evening. Um, just briefly before we go on to more recent times, would would you agree with that after that Newcastle game? It was a very, very low point, wasn't it? It was me, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I stayed to the end and um that's just what I've what I've always done, regardless, really. Um and it was a tough, it was a tough watch because obviously for the first sort of twenty five minutes to half an hour or so before they got that first goal, we were probably the better well, we were the better side, you know. It was it was their first chance of the game, first shots, obviously picked the Pirate out and he put the rebound in and from that moment, because at that particular point, you know, Everton just weren't scoring goals, were they? And, you know, we know how, how well Newcastle have done and are doing this season. And it was always going to be difficult uh, because, like you say, the, you know, the, the coach welcome was unbelievable. The atmosphere, I thought, outside the ground was, was really upbeat and positive. And then inside the ground, it it, it, it sort of it funneled in with, with all the uh, with the crowd and, you know, it, it doesn't get much better than that. You know, and you you think to yourself when you when you leave Goodison Park that night, what more could we have done as a fan base? Because there was nothing more, was there? You know, that was we give everything, and you know, I think the players they 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 sort of psychological state they're so fragile at times, aren't they? Especially at that point, and you just sort of knew that if they were greeted with any kind of adversity, that they weren't going to come back into the game, and. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was a, a real disappointing performance in the end after that first, you know, decent half hour. But then, like you say, when you walked out, you did think, you know, this is going to be a tough ass now for us to to go away to obviously a relegation rival in, in Leicester, of course, and then obviously we have Brighton to follow, and obviously what 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 is to follow that particular game? And you just thought, I can't see where we're going to get probably, you know, six points, which is maybe what we need, four to six points possibly. Maybe a little bit more than maybe maybe five. It's you know, it was all guesswork at the moment, but mm. he just thought from a psychological perspective, for for players and fans, it seemed to be a little bit of a one of the nails in in, in our coffin at that particular point. Um, so certainly that that was probably the, the the biggest low point of the season. Leaving Goodison Park and thinking, you know what, relegation it is becoming very very real, and it's still real now. Don't get me wrong, but we're talking at, at a slightly more positive point, aren't we? Which you know, in football, you know, a couple of weeks is, is a short space of time, and then things can change and can certainly change down the bottom. But at that particular point, I thought it was inevitable. Yeah. And it's amazing how uh, I'm not quite at that point just now after after two decent performances. Yeah, the mood's completely changed. Obviously, we fast forward to, to, to the Monday night after the Newcastle game. And, and you know, as you mentioned, there, it was a huge, huge game against relegation rivals, Leicester, who, you know, we're still there's still a long way to go, of course, but at the time, I think you very much thought that Leicester were probably quite well equipped to get out of it at that stage before the ball was kicked. And when we played Leicester, um, you know, seemed to be revitalised almost under under Dean Smith a little bit. So going into that game, it was it was almost a shock to see how how, how well we played. I mean, let's right, Everton played really well at the King Power. I thought we played really well, and albeit you know individual errors again, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, you know, we could have easily came away with all three points, and you know. 
we get a point at, at Leicester, who was it was going to be a tough game, of course. It was. I was quite surprised, actually, at how poor Leicester were that night. And then, of course, the Brighton game. And who, who saw that coming? Before you know it, we've clawed back four points there from two away games, two quite tough away games. And we've come away with four points, which has done wonders for confidence, morale. Uh, we're out of the bottom three, of course. Again, I want to reiterate there's a long way to go, but we are out of the bottom three at this moment. So just looking back at those two games, following on from the Newcastle one, what 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 changed for you, Mike? I'm obviously, Dominic Calvert-Lewin put in some really strong performances, of course. We're starting to see a much more fitter and sharper Calvert-Lewin. Okay, he, he, he you know tweaked the defence a little bit for the Brighton game, but even in the, for the most part the Leicester game, we've looked a lot more. In, in these two games, we've looked as dangerous going forward as we have done all season, I'd say. We, we, we do, of course. I mean, we've, we've gone away from home and scored seven goals in two games, which is just unheard of for Everton sides of, of recent times, especially. But going back to that Leicester game, we came away disappointed not to win the game, of course. I decided to sort of look at it from another another angle. And yet, OK, for me, we should have got the three points. We were the better side. Mistakes, as we know, cost us, which has happened quite often over the last couple of seasons. We'll go back to just before our time and Jordan Pickford saves that penalty. Yeah. Now, is, are we going to look back on that when the season's over, fingers crossed, and look at that as the pivotal moment in in, in our running the, at the end of this season? Because yeah. it doesn't say that we lose the game. You know, as much as we were a better side, we, we should have been up ourselves. You know, we probably should have been 3-1 up ourselves. And we could have gone in 3-1 down. And Leicester, you know, I think that the, the big issue in that game was defensively, we we probably played too high as, as a back four. We didn't have the centre halves and you know to, to play a high line anyway because we know both James Tarkowski and, and Michael Keane are particularly quick, and and that just left space for for their wide players and Jamie Vardy to run in behind. And I came away disappointed not to get the three points, but then thinking you know overall maybe maybe a point isn't too bad because we've kept Leicester within touching distance. They haven't pulled away. We've got another point ourselves to, to add you know to catch up uh, to to other sides as well. Uh, but I still was a little bit concerned because defensively, that game we weren't great, and it was that was the point, wasn't it? Again, where where fans were saying, you know, the manager's got to look at that now, and I know obviously the media quizzed them in the press conference pre Brighton about Michael Keane again and said, you know, his form's not being great. He, he obviously he's made mistakes in, in a Leicester game, gave away a penalty. As we said, the line was too high, and and he, he certainly couldn't catch Jamie Vardy when when he was away as well. Just little, just things that he was doing wrong. And in the games previous, Newcastle he was poor. Um, you know, probably the only anomaly in, in that's be probably be the, the Palace game where it was a pretty non-event nearly, wasn't it? So it, I still came away a little bit concerned after that game, thinking, "Great, we've scored two in the attacking sense. Twenty-three shots in the game. What, what was it? Eighteen shots in the box, was it? Yeah, the most we've ever had since." Way. So yeah, since since that date has ever been released in in twenty sixteen, so eighteen shots in the box, you know we we certainly should have scored more than two. But to be an attacking threat, you sort of had that little bit of positivity. Thought, well, hang on, you know, I know I know Leicester aren't great at the back, but Everton aren't great going forward. So we've created we created some some really good chances. We scored two goals. What can we take from that going going into Brighton? And then Brighton was just. A step up again. We we think the manager got it wrong against Leicester in terms of some of the personnel that he picked and not using a substitute, which is which is all always a big thing with me as well. If you're looking to try and win a game, yeah, against Brighton, you, you've got to give the manager immense praise because you've got it absolutely spot on. You, you, you can't criticise the setup, the application of the players. It was absolutely perfect, and any side going to Brighton should look at that as a template. You know, do you know what? That's how you beat them. Yeah. Luckily, obviously, the Everton players as well were, were terrific on the day and, and in the attacking sense, fantastic. Be- best I've seen Everton in, in, in an uh, attacking, attacking sense for, for years, in my opinion. Yeah, oh, did, absolutely. Did, did it was sensational. It was just, from the off, it was it, 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 didn't, it didn't feel real, did it? Because like, obviously we scored early. I mean, we scored relatively early against Leicester and, you know, we let, we let them back into the game stupidly and the equaliser, you know, when Everton always go one nil up, there's always that feeling that like you know you always need that that cushion because it's it always feels inevitable that they're going to equalise at some point. We've never been able to get comfortable, and then for it to go to two and then to three, it was just unbelievable, wasn't it? And again, I go back to that point how you know players like Abdullah Dakora bombing into the box, Dwight McNeil playing with such a freedom, and you know he's really coming into his own now. And Calvert Lewin, 
his hold up play and that turn that he started to implement into, into his game as well. He's he's starting to look really sharp now, isn't he? And obviously he didn't get on the score sheet, but you can't take away his his influence on that game and what he's starting to show now. He's getting back to full fitness, can you? It, most important, well, outside of I'd probably say Jordan Pickford, he was to get especially second half. Dominic Calvert Lewin's it is his selflessness on the yeah. day, you know. That you you lose that that turn early on, where obviously which which was uh, which was significant for the first goal inside thirty four seconds, but all first half especially. And to be fair, second when it was a bit more of a, a war of attrition, and we was obviously we were sitting deep and just just defending. You know, Dominic Calvert Lewin was doing what we know that he can do, and the performance that he put in was probably as good as I've seen him since since Carlo Ancelotti left the club. Yeah. I think I think that that is what a, a fit Dominic Calvert Lewin can get. Yeah, obviously got his assist. For the first goal, could have had a goal himself. I mean, the the, the one which he's he's dragged wide when he he sent the keeper the wrong way with his eyes didn't connect particularly well. The one where James Garner set the ball for Garner to strike the ball, and you think, don't be selfish there, you know, as a striker, just you, you get it yourself. But listen, you know what? It's it's all, all lives and butters, isn't it? We won the game five one. It doesn't matter, but he was terrific. Hold up, play fantastic. I think it was thirteen aerial duels. He won nine. Um, ju- just his work rate, he was just a pain, absolute pain for the two centre halves. I mean, I was surprised that that Dunk stayed on. They, they, they took off Webster, didn't they, at half time? Yeah. Um, but for me, Dunk was having an absolute nightmare against Calvert Lewin. He was struggling massively, and you know, it showed inside 34 seconds when he's, he's, he's turned him, he's, he's dived in, Dom's turned him. He runs away strong with the ball, you know, you're not going to catch him, shows his pace, shows his power. Did it a few times, I thought, in the game. And and that's that's what he brings you. You know, he, he he's terrific. And everyone who was, you know, you look back when he was he was injured and you know all these all these comments come out about him not being good enough, being a championship yeah. player, etc. No, no, he's not. Listen, he, he he's a top level striker. Needs obviously needs to bring more goals to his game, but he's been injured for so long. That will he will get sharper again. But I think overall he does look really sharp. And you know, I think credit it again to Sean Dyche. He's not throwing him in. He said, you're getting yourself 100% fit. And, you know, managers previously have just gone, why are you 80, 85? We need you. Lash him in. Sean Dice, you know, as much as we will have been saying, just, just put him in. We need someone because Mo, Mo pays poor. Sim's obviously very, very green and still learn, obviously learned this trade. He stuck to his guns, the manager. Got it spot on. Fingers crossed that that's Dom now for the rest of the season, fit and firing because we're, we're a much better outfit with Dominic Calvert Lewin up top than anybody else in that squad. That's it, isn't it? And you know what? I 100% agree with you when you say he's looking as sharp and as fit as he probably has done since under Carlo Ancelotti. And again, yeah, I completely agree. You've got to give credit to the manager with the way he's handled him. There probably has been occasions where he could have brought him back a bit earlier, but he's held him back. And he's, you know, I was watching an interview with Sean Dyche, uh, the club put out um, about, about an hour or so ago. And, he, you know, he's reinstating that again, how it was all about just managing him in the right manner. Perhaps hasn't been the case previously. You know, you think back to Rafa, uh, even Lampard and, uh, as well. So to see um, Calvert Lewin back and look on a threat, it's massive for us because it can't be. It can't be overstated just how how much we've missed that focal point all season, and the, just how much it, it's transformed the the whole side. It, it's it's you know it's one player out of eleven, but it, it's made such a difference. It's unbelievable. Like I said, seven goals in two games. You know, if if someone told you that we were going to do that after that Newcastle game, you wouldn't have believed it. It's just you know Calvert Lewin's getting fitter and fitter and fitter, and like you said, hopefully now between the end of the season, we've got three huge games that can hopefully see us home, and Calvert Lewin's going to be a massive part in that if we are going to get over the line. Obviously, the change that was made and that a lot of fans were happy to see was Michael Keane coming out the sides, and we we briefly touched on it before. Look, really shaky in recent weeks, and he's only got and he's only got worse. Um, you know the Leicester game. You know you don't want to go in on him too much, but you know if he doesn't, if he doesn't, if he tracks his man for the first one, then you know I, I very much doubt that Leicester get that goal. And it, it, it was the right time to take him out, wasn't it? I think Sean Dyche couldn't have persisted with that any longer. And of course, Yeri Mina, who has completely came in out the cold, um, and it was like he'd never been away. Yeri Mina for me. I know there's a lot, lot of noise about how yes, he probably is the best, one of the best centre halves at the club. Just his body's let him down years. Um, but just how impressed were you with, with Mina coming back into the side after so long out and just you know fitting in so easily? I think that was the impressive thing, wasn't it? The fact that he, he has has been out you know for, for such a long time, and we know he's been fit for bloody months, hasn't he? You know, at yeah. least sort of two or three months. He has been fit and, and and good to go, and that that's what the frustration has been for us fans is knowing he's on the bench and thinking, well, I'm gone. 
you, you've thrown in Michael Keane, which fair enough, you know, they, they, they've got a past relationship. He trusts him, he knows his game. And I understood when Connor Cody was dropped and, and Connor Cody's former dip, to be fair, and he brought in Michael Keane. I understood it because, yeah. you know, he, he, he's, I think he's very much uh, a manager who relies on trust. Hence why, you know, Seamus Coleman's fit, he plays at right back over Nathan Patterson. And we could all sit here and argue, well, overall, we might think that Patterson's a better right back now than, than the 34-year-old Seamus Coleman. Um, but obviously, Seamus Coleman deserved, and like, you know, deserved his, his place. And, and we know what he's all about. And before he got injured against against Leicester, he was probably the best player on the pitch, to be fair. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, yeah, you mean it. We we all know how good he is, and he's improved so much in the last probably two years or so for me. He's become a leader. He's a talker. I mean, it was he's six foot five. He, he probably weighs probably fifteen and a half stone. He's an absolute nightmare. He winds people up. Yeah, he's in the air from a, a defensive and an attacking sense. He's good with the ball at his feet. He he should got extra attributes that Michael Keane hasn't got. Mm. So when when you look at his fans, you're thinking, well. Surely, as a manager, you want to play your best available eleven, and yeah, you mean it comfortably should be starting at centre half. He's he's in our best eleven, and that's why we just couldn't understand it. But I would have made the change earlier. We probably probably all would. But fair play, you know, Sean Dyche um, has has made the change for the Brighton game. Yeah, you mean it comes in, look fantastic. You know, especially that second half when you know it was. It was literally, you know, it was like the Alamo, wasn't it? They were, for the first sort of twenty minutes, we think out of our out of our half with a sustained little bit of pressure and possession till the seventy third minute. I was when, when I was watching the game, I looked at the clock and thought, yeah, we had thirty seconds of knocking the ball around and one and free kick, and that was the first time that we that we'd done that. And the second half, especially, I thought he, I thought he was fantastic. One time he dived in, didn't he, and got beat by Evan Fergus, and he got the shot away, but obviously Pickford saved it. Um, but he was great winning headers. Throw his body on the line, put his face in the way of, of shots and doing what, what we know Yeah, you mean it does. And you know, we know he's gonna go in the summer. We we know there's no no new deal there. There can't be, because you can't have a player who you signed so many years ago who hasn't even made a hundred appearances, by the way. Yeah. Um, but Crazy. that was a that potentially there was a rumor going around that if he, if he got to a hundred appearances, Everton would have to pay Barcelona a bit more money. If he plays every game now to the end of the season, he gets to ninety nine. So Everton are potentially covering the backs. We don't know. The rumour mill was in was in uh, full swing last week. So that could be one of the reasons why. I mean, it's a gamble. If that's the case, you're gambling your Premier League lives yeah. on paying more money out to a club for, for a player. So it, it, it's a massive gamble if, if it doesn't pay off, by the way. So um, if that's the reason, we don't know. But great to have him back. Hopefully he gets through the, the rest of this week unscathed and, and he's fit for, for Sunday. And for me, he's he's the ideal centre half to go in against against Erlen Haaland because he's he's someone like Rudiger shows against against City in in midweek. Who can really wind him up and get under his skin? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he mean it there. Um, it's unlikely that he will be continuing on with the club past the summer. Um, just just on that conversation about the centre backs, obviously it's it's a position where there is a, we are quite. You know, it's not an area that we're lacking at all. Of course, with Jared Brantwaite, he had to come back as well. And um, I just wanted to ask you, Mike, what what's your sort of opinion on the whole centre half situation? We've got Connor Cody there. You know, coming to the end of his loan deal with Wolves. You know, to believe to have a four million pound um, option to buy. Um, and then you, you think you've got Brantway coming back, or mentioned then, you, you know, you've still got Mason Holgate in there. You think a lot of people probably wouldn't be too sad to see the back of. And then, of course, you've got Tarkovsky and, and Michael Keane, who's still, I think he's still got another 18 months left on his deal or something like that, Michael Keane. So, you know, he's, he's not going to be leaving in the summer, well, unless someone comes in for him. Um, where, where do you stand on all this? Do you, do you think Cody's going to go? Do you think Cody will stay? I think we can probably agree Mean is going to go. Um, is he Brantway being a first team player next season? Um, is he going to be the new partner for Tarkovsky? Are we going to sign Cody? What, what do you think is going to happen? Because you know it's it, it's very much an area of, of much debate at the minute with Evertonians. Yeah, and it, it's tricky, isn't it? Because like you say, yeah, you mean is going to go. So there, there, there's one down straight away. Um, you are going to get Jared Brantway back now. Whether Everton feel or whether Everton need to, to cash in on certain players, who knows? Jared Brantwaite had, a, had a, a great time over in, in Holland, of course, with PSV. Um, 
So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they, they certainly couldn't pay whatever and would want for Jared Grant to be. So I don't think he'll probably sign there permanently. I'd like to think he's going to come back now. He's, he has played Premier League football before, don't forget, under, under Carlo Ancelotti. Yeah. So he, he's, he's and obviously, Frank Lampard, uh, he played for him as well when he got sent off against against. Yeah, Brown. that's right, yeah. So, so he has played for a couple of managers. So he's got a bit of experience there, hasn't he? So I think having that full season out on loan, and playing European football. Yeah, at a good uh, level. Like, yeah. At a good level, yeah. And, and top end of the league. They obviously they won a trophy the other day as well. So for him personally, he's probably now had a really good apprenticeship. He's he's travelled fair play to the kid. He's left the country and gone to players say it outside of the country, which you don't see many English youngsters doing. Um so we he for me will come in and, and we'll be ready to go. Left footed as well, which it, it is fantastic. If you have a left foot left footed centre half or the right footed centre half. It doesn't get much better than that. So I'd like to think that he's going to be a mainstay next season. Him, James Tarkowski, um, Michael Keane will stay because, you know, assuming that Sean Dice, again, this is all assuming, by the way, we don't get relegated yeah. because things will change. But if we, if we err on the side of positivity uh, for, for this for the, the conversation, you, you'd think then that Keane would stay. Holgate will go. You know, I, I don't think, you know, when, when Sean Dice has used him, um, he's come on as a sense of mid, I think, hasn't he? He's also played right back and being sent off. Um, so I think he will be gone. Connor Cove is a funny one because, you know, do, yeah. Do, yeah, if it, if it's four million quid, you know, he's a great professional. You can see at the end of the game against against Brighton, he was right over to Yagamina, give him a give him a hug and all that. He, he's he's always in the tunnel in the warm-up, even now, if you watch the on-the-road footage from the Brighton game, he's the one who's talking, he's the one who's, who's shouting. He's not even, not even getting a game, but the professional that he is, that's that's what he's all about. And sometimes you need a little bit of that. So maybe, maybe, we do pay the four million quid for him and you, you go in there with those four four cents of halves. Um, and then obviously you've got a few of the younger lads as well who were sort of on the on the periphery. So it's a difficult one. I, I always change my mind with Connor Cody, but I think yeah. with Yerry Mina going and probably Holgate going to be on his way, he could be an easy option. If we haven't got loads and loads of money to spend, and, and I'm sure we will sell one asset promptly, Amadou Onana, Jordan Pickford again. This is if we stay in the Premier League. We've got, we've got a few players there that we can sell to bring money in. But I don't think it's going to be a case of Everton going to have, say, 70, 80 million pounds to spend in the Premier League. Then he could be a, a, a cheap and safe option to, to make sure we've got four cents a half. That is, isn't it? You've got to ask the question like, are you going to get much more of a better value, even if a squad player for four million pounds as a centre half with Conor Cody's leadership? His experience, and you know, let's have it right. He's a good player. It's funny in a way, isn't it? And it's almost a little bit, I don't want to say disappointing because you know, we know these things happen in football, but he started the season really positively. And you know, when we briefly had that that little purple patch under Lampard right at the beginning of the season, um, you know, and we had them back to back wins against Southampton and West Ham, and you know, and we were had some positive results in the derby, we were unlucky there. You know, Connor Cody, he was almost like a fan's favorite straight away, and he probably still is to a certain extent. You know, people, people like having him in and around the club, so. It'll, I think it'll be a shame if he's to leave because, you know, I feel like he, his Everton story probably could, could go on. And for him as well, you know, local lad, I feel like he, he'd like to stay. I feel like at his age and his point in his career, I think he'd probably like to stay. But, it, it you know, we don't know. It's all guesswork, isn't it? It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with him because he's not a bad player by any means. But can we really see him going back to Wolves and playing a big part there? I'm not so sure. Um, so it will be interesting to see what happens with there going forward. But just before we uh, wrap things up, obviously we just want to take a step back and look at the wider picture. You know, at the start of the podcast, we we talk, spoke about the feeling around the club after that Newcastle game, and you know, in the space of like a week, week and a half later, it's it's completely turned on its head again. And you know, that's that's the Premier League. That's that's what being in a relegation battle is like, I suppose. Um, but it it's sort of like been nailed down now. I think Southampton wrote off, I think, after the, after that result against Forrest. And it's very much now between ourselves, Forrest, Leicester and Leeds. Um, I was watching Jamie Carragher after that game. And he, he was of the opinion that Everton probably have the more favourable fixtures when you look at some of the teams that the, these these sides around us still have to play. Um, I know it's a very broad question to ask, but how do you see it sort of playing out, Mike, if if you can? Um, how many do you think? I, I've heard people say, Maybe we need three points, four points, maybe even more than that. 
my opinion is that I I think we've got to aim for at least four because I I'd like to be wrong, but I just have a feeling that Leicester or Leeds are going to get a result from somewhere, and I, I don't know why. I, I particularly look at that Newcastle game this weekend, the early kickoff at Ellen Road with Big Sam. I hope I'm wrong, but I have a feeling Leeds might get something there. Leicester as well. I just feel like they've got a result in them. I don't know what it is. I know that they look so poor week in, week out, and they look and they constantly like not doing themselves any favors. But part of me, there's still a voice in the back of my mind thinking that Leicester won't go down, and I don't know why that is. Forest again, they have some tough games. So, how how do you see it playing out? It's like the impossible question, and I apologize for that. But in your opinion, where, where do you see it going as we enter these final three games? It's so difficult. I mean, you know, as we said before the Leicester game, we were written off by most. You know, we even. Before the Brighton game, I think Everton's uh, chances of getting being relegated like, were like were eighty percent, but judging by the data that, that that I saw the other day, so it changes quickly. And you know, it only really takes one win, as we've seen, to, to really change momentum. And hopefully, fingers crossed, it does change our momentum. You know, that make no mistake, that win for us against Brighton is massive. It's massive for us as uh, you know, Everton players, the staff, the fans. It's massive in terms of what it does to the other side. And they think, oh, you know, how have they gone there with 5 1? It wasn't just we've gone to we've gone to Brighton and we've sat there and we've won 1 0. We've gone yeah. to Brighton and we battered them. Yeah. We, we, it, as I said earlier on, that is the template how, how to beat Brighton. We knew exactly what they'd do. We didn't get sucked in when the centre halves, as, as they did at Goodison Park, the centre half stood on the ball and said, come on, come and get it. And Everton obliged at Goodison Park. Not against not against Brighton away from home. We said, no, do whatever you want, we'll just sit here. And the fact that the players broke with, with such intensity, uh, with such pace, with with such precision. I mean, let's not forget, if you look, look at those goals at the weekend, and I will, I will get back to the relegation points in a second, but you look at the goals we scored at the weekend, there's probably there's probably three goals there that are up there for our goal of the season. That's how good the goals were. The core was, was ridiculously good. You know, what, what a strike that was. Side for volume with pace and power. Pass a keep goalkeeper near post. So I mean, Neil's both goals were, were, were terrific. Um, but that I'm hoping is a little bit of a stake to the heart of the other sides around, and they think, oh, my you know, that, how are we going to get? How are we, how are we now going to turn this round? But then, you, then don't forget, it's two points, two points of difference here between us and the bottom three. It's not many points, like you say. Leeds are first up this weekend against Newcastle. They win that game, they drop us into the bottom three straight away before we even play Man City. And what does that do to us then psychologically? It's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. You know, so, so you're just hoping that Newcastle, fantastic season. You know, we've seen them, you know, close up and personal a couple of weeks ago at Goodison Park. Um, and you hope that they can take that that same kind of intensity. The atmosphere didn't didn't seem to impact them at Goodison and, and it was it was red hot that night. Yeah. Seemed to just, you know, they, they saw it the first 20, 25 minutes or so, played the way into the into the game, dealt with the the pressure from the fans and from, from Everton as well, dealt with it well. And then just just absolutely battered us, and, and hopefully they'll do the same to Leeds. Um, but it just changes, doesn't it, all the time? I mean, you know, we're on thirty two points. I, I when I was speaking the, the other the other week to Vinnie O'Connor, and we had a chat, and I was thinking, you know, I said I think thirty four points might be enough. I really do because you know it's taken obviously a big win for us. I thought we'd get a win before the season was over. This is pre Leicester, um, so that was four games to go. So I always thought we'd get a win. We've got to win now. I think the important thing now is, is, is to consolidate that. I'd love to go into the last game of the season against Bournemouth being safe. Oh. For us to do that, we're going to have to beat probably one of Man City or Wolves, really. We're going to need three points. If we get three points in the next two games, maybe that might be enough for us to not have to go into the final game of the season with, with relegation over our heads. But as you see, you know, it takes one win from any other side. And, you know, Forrest, they're a point above. Difficult games, you know, we can get past them. Great. It's another team that we've that we've we've gone above. But Leeds and Leicester, who knows? You know, they could it only takes the one win yeah. and then we'll make some changes. And like you say, you know, I mean Leicester are playing Liverpool on Monday night. Hopefully, you know, if we can end this weekend not on the bottom three, that's big. That 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 again is another week gone. We're not on the bottom three. There's two games to go. Going to Wolves, we're now safe. Hopefully playing with the flip-flops on. Go to Molyneux. Great Everton, Everton Sutherland fan base. 
go there, win the game. And that could be the game, hopefully, that, that, that keeps us in the Premier League. But it's so so many twists and turns. As 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 we, we showed against Brighton, anything can happen. You know, if you've got the right game plan and, and the players' heads are right, you know, and, and, and they trust the manager, anything can happen. But you know, Sam Allardyce being at Leeds is just another factor, isn't it? To 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 look at, you know, him coming in and, and potentially being a manager who could send Everton down. You know, by managing a, a club in in and around us, what you know, that'll be uh, some some end to his story, wouldn't it? But I'm just hoping that that we that win has has done a lot psychologically to other teams and to us. And I think that the final three games, I think three points will probably do it in the final three games. I've got to be honest. I, I hope so, mate. I really do. I it's it's just horrible because you know it's almost like the, the finish lines in sight in a sense now. You know. After the Manchester City game, we're into those round of fixtures where, you know, for one side, it'll be their last home game of the season, so on and so forth. And it, mm-hmm. it's really start, you know, it's the home run then. And, and, you know, and the finish line is very much in sight. I just fear, I just really fear that Leicester or Leeds have results in them. I really do. But we don't know. We just don't know. We, we, we can't call anything. You know, Newcastle might might rock up and 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 paste them. We we just don't know. This is that this is the, it's the not knowing that's the horrible thing when you're in a relegation battle. You just want it's, it's thing, almost like you're watching is, a TV though, show. You want to know what happens next. It's horrible. You do, but I think the thing is, you know, we we go back to to post Leicester, and we were looking for favors after that particular game. Yeah. Now it's in our own hands again, Mal. So we we we've done a little bit of hard work, got a fantastic victory. The players must be on on cloud now, and I know Sean Dice said in, in an interview, I think the one that you, that you alluded to today, and he said, you know, you, you don't want to make too much of the yeah. the highs, don't make too much of the lows. The fans can, the fans should, of course, we should. We we should all. I'm still reveling in that that win now because yeah. it's been a, a terrible season. So I, I've watched the, I've watched the highlights back countless times now because I just to enjoy them all over again, and we should be able to do that. But as players, he's right in what he says. Don't make too much of the highs. Don't make too much of the lows. Because then it, it, he said that's what was happening when he first came in. You know, I think we, we beat Arsenal. And it was like, we won the league. Well, hang on. Just, just temper that. You've won a game of football. Yeah. There's loads of games to go. We're still in trouble. A lot of work to do. Same goes now. Fantastic game. Great win. We're still banging some of the three games to go. <laughs> if, you, if you don't win probably one more game, maybe get three or four more points, you're going to go down. So... Let's just bring it back down. Let's just 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 relax, prepare properly. I, I fully fully expect the manager to have a, a, a good game plan at, at, against City. But again, if we lose the game, don't lose our minds because there's, there's still there's still two games to go. That they're a fantastic side, City. People are saying you know it, it's coming coming at a good time because they're playing Real Madrid yeah. either side of the Everton game. The squad's ridiculously good. They, they can make can make eleven changes and doesn't still matter, be does better than Everton. Doesn't matter. So it's it's about attitudes, about application. It's about Goodison Park. They, you know that factor again. What can we do as fans? I'm sure it'll be be, be a great atmosphere after after Monday's win. Uh, but there's going to be plenty of twists and turns in these final three games. I just hope that the twists and turns don't really involve us and and we just pull ourselves quietly away from things before the final game of the season. But listen, it's it's all wishful thinking. It's one game at a time. Don't get ahead of ourselves and and just keep on keep on pushing along. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Um, you know, we'll, we'll leave it there, mate. But it, yeah, it's a few more twists and turns, hopefully, but the importance of that win can't be understated because it, it was almost like we were waiting for that result. Seems like every team has that result. It was almost like last year, you felt like it was the the Chelsea game or the Leicester game that really just sort of lit the fuse a little bit then to think, right, let, let, let's drag ourselves up the line here. Hopefully Brighton acted as that because we were waiting for that result, I feel like. And to get that was huge. And, you know, I know you, you touched on it yourself before, Mike, that you're for other teams to look at that as well. You're for us to, you know, bounce back after that real low from the Newcastle game to, to, to say, you know what, we're up for this fight. We're not going nowhere. And we're going to crawl with our fingernails over the finish line. And like I said, it really is the home stretch now. And hopefully we can get there. But that Brighton result was huge for us. And the next few weeks are going to be very interesting, to say the least. And once we can get them out the way, we can all forget about football for a bit and look forward to our summers, hopefully still as a Premier League club. So big thanks to Mike for jumping on the podcast today. Be sure to check out the Unholy Trinity podcast as well. Um, Be sure to keep your eyes peeled for the Man City preview. Um, Hopefully 
we can get a decent result. But of course, it's Man City. It's going to be a really big ask. So um, big thanks to Mike for jumping on with us. And we shall speak to you next time on the Toffee Blues. Nice one.